uh, is it better? Yes, because uh, we make a recording, but if you oh, don't speak for the recording. Yes. yes. Okay. Good. I'll make it for the recording. Okay. Um, so. Um, uh, so Lisa Oaks uh, highlights some of these things. Um, uh, uh, as a result of all of these factors that infant research is hard, uh, sample sizes are typically very low, and she analyzed them to be, you know, typical sample sizes of eight to twenty-four infants in, in typical studies. Um, and as a result, many studies have very low power, leading to replicability issues. So balancing sample size and, uh, uh, and effect size and uh, cost effectiveness is actually very hard to do. And what can we do about that? Um, so uh, I guess it's time for action. And this picture illustrates that. And it's also a way of showing off my daughter when she was one year old, or less than one year old even. Um, good. So. What can we do about this? So, uh, of course, the many babies approach, uh, and we will highlight some of some of this feature throughout uh, today's talks. Uh, but there, are, there, there could potentially different types of solutions for solving these sorts of problems, uh, and I just want to highlight them very briefly. One of them is altering our measurement paradigms. Right, get better measurements. Um, uh, we can get more precise measurements, uh, more process-oriented measurements, such as eye tracking measures, for example, are typically uh, a little bit more reliable than manually coded uh, looking times, for example. So that would be one way to go, altering our measurements. Uh, another way to go is altering our analysis methods, just making more of the data that we do have by applying more sophisticated uh, methods, Bayesian methods, can be very helpful in this respect. Uh, and of course, the most important avenue that also the Many Babies approach follows is to increase our sample sizes. And I guess here we're back to Toby. With the microphone this time. With the microphone. Um, so uh, this is what we um, want to better understand. Here is the schematic overview. Those are words um, that come across um, your um, work life, I guess. Um, here is uh, just to a, a reminder how this can be seen. I won't go into detail here, but uh, Many Babies tries to, um, or, or we all should try to better understand how reproducible results are and findings, how replicable they are, how robust our findings are, and how to what extent they can be generalized to other populations or different contexts. Um, and this is not only um, interesting from a methodological uh, um, uh, perspective, but also from the theoretical perspective. Um, we cannot, so good theories need really a good understanding of, of that stuff, um, not a single, single study with um, uh, eight infants showing that, and this can be taken for granted. Um, the, we need a lot more data uh, and different perspectives on that to, to better understand it. Um, this is why the Many Babies Consortium was uh, founded back in 2015 in the light of the more general uh, replication crisis in the whole um, field of developmental, uh, of, of, yeah, whole psychology research. Um, uh, Mike Frank was the one who started it with a blog post and the discussion started and people were trying to find a way um, um, yeah, uh, uh, out of this a way forward, constructive solution. Here's some highlights. So it's, um, I really like that first point, it says radically collaborative horizontal framework. Everyone can lead and contribute and this is something that I um, really uh, experience. So Every idea is great. One, one example, there's the Many Babies, Many Webcams spin-off where we evaluated whether um, online eye checking with uh, WebGazer is um, an okay tool as compared to in-lab eye checking. This was an idea, uh, or this was a setup by a um, second semester bachelor student, and he's the lead of that spin-off project and the first author of the now published paper. So really everyone um, can, can do s stuff there. Bring in an idea and there will be a crowd pretty soon, uh, a team forms, and we perform that task. Um, 
consensus-based study designs. This is a short expression for a process that might take up to, I don't know, many babies two, maybe two years until we <laughs> made up our mind um, how the paradigm should look and what conditions we want to test, and this is still ongoing. Um, in other words, we do this really thoroughly from the, from the bottom, um, try to think um, like um, uh, of every possibilities, alternatives, what is the best way to test um, what we want to test. Uh, conceptual applications, which means this is, um, has more, contains more information about um, the phenomenon itself, um, about its characteristics and about it, its generalizability. Um, we try to collect samples that are diverser than the samples before. Um, means different countries, different cultures, uh, different um, contexts. Of course, transparent research practices, um, everything is um, open um, on the various data sharing, code sharing um, websites. I uh, guess that's pretty much it. Here are the this is a list of the current empirical projects. Um, some of them will be presented later, so I won't uh, talk too much about that. There are um, projects that test phenomena and projects that test like, methodological aspects of um, developmental research. Here's a short timeline. As I said, started in 2015, then in 2016 Many Babies One on infant directed speech started. This was chosen because this was a quite robust um, phenomenon which was replicated um, a lot of times before um, to have this kind of a proof of concept. So um, there were strong predictions that this should be um, found also in this many lab approach. It was found and here, as it says, concept proven, move to more controversial topics. This is what has been done later with especially Many Babies 2, Theory of Mind in uh, Infancy. Um, then we have uh, Many Babies 3 on statistical learning, Many Babies 4 on social evaluation. You will hear about this later. Um, rural learning 2018, so the different projects are coming in. Um, then in 2000 and 2000, uh, like this was a reaction to the COVID um, situation. How can be how can children be tested at home, which was due to the pandemic, but also um, has a lot of advantages. Um, you can reach uh, samples that you usually can't reach because they don't have the resources to come into the lab or live in rural areas um, and stuff like that. Then many babies started to reach out to other many projects. Um, you will get a glimpse on that um, later. There's a brand new project on um, neonatal imitation, so the, the Meltsov um, studies, which is um, in preparation at the moment. And last year was kind of important because data collection finish, finished for a lot of projects and we are about to analyze them, have some first results and um, um, put that into our pre-registered, um, in, into our registered reports and finally publish them. Uh, the map is outdated, but the numbers here are, um, are the ones from yesterday. So over 600 researchers from 50 countries and six continents. So Antarctica isn't on that list, but um, we have people from every other continent. Um, that's also my slide, right? Um, but I think I will, because of the time, I will skip that because I said kind of everything about this. Yeah, I did. <laughs> That's you. Yeah, maybe one thing to say about uh, uh, about this slide. Uh, one thing I particularly like about the many babies approach is uh, is that we also test across different types of paradigms, such as the head term preference, the central fixation, and eye tracking uh, paradigms. And that's very very uncommon to do in infant studies that you would have one lab and would have the availability to test all three paradigms, right? And so you can only do that in multi-lab settings. Um, and uh, yeah, the Many Babies Project uh, typically use that uh, to have labs use either, either, either of these um, uh, settings. Um, so uh, I, think, I think, Toby, you said most of this, what we had here. Uh, is that true? Uh, yeah, so Many Babies One um, uh, uses, um, uh, well, delivers something very big uh, that we hope 
uh, other Many Babies uh, project will also do, uh, and it provides many other opportunities, right? So it has data of over 2,000 infants, uh, and as a result of that, not only the main findings that were published in the original Many Babies One paper uh, are of interest, but this is a huge resource that we can use for other types of uh, spin-off questions and uh, follow-up questions, etc. Um, and many people are already working on that, um, and we can also do this across uh, many baby studies. So, uh, for example, looking at uh, distributions of looking times or in the eye tracking data, we will have, you know, eye tracking data for thousands of infants that are really robustly and nicely organized into uh, accessible repositories at, by the end of this year, for sure, we will have those for many babies one and then also for two, three, and four. Uh, so that will provide a great opportunity to uh, answer all sorts of follow-up questions and secondary data analysis questions. Um, then, uh, recently, a recent development is that we're also collaborating with other networks of this type. So, following the Many Babies initiative in 2015, a number of other networks from, of researchers have started their own collective uh, collectives of, of researchers, such as uh, the many birds, many dogs, many primates, uh, many goats, um, and the psychological science accelerator. And these are all collectives of researchers, you know, binding, bringing their forces together to uh, devise multi-lab studies. Um, and what we realized uh, when we saw all these networks coming up is that that also provided us with the opportunity to use all of these networks to, for comparative cognition, right? And to study evolutionary, uh, let's say, questions within uh, cognition research. And so we set up the, the many, many network to have a, a network collaboration between all of these networks. And we're now in the phase of devising the first study. Uh, Okay, so one more remark about improving generalizability. So generalizability, as, as defined earlier on the slide, concerned like, you know, different samples, different contexts. Uh, a, a, a paper by Yerconi and papers like this by Barry Bo take this one step further and say, and, and, and launch this concept of radical uh, you know, generalizability or radical randomization where not only you want to uh, uh, generalize across contexts and uh, and samples, but you also want to uh, generalize across all sorts of factors, such as experimental factors. Well, that's why I very much like this idea of having different types of paradigms, head term preference, eye tracking, etc. Uh, but also stimulus, for example, right? So in typical in typ in our typical experiments, we use a single stimulus set, which is a little bit weird if we want to talk about you know language scales and when, and, when, and we happen to use only one set of stimuli that pertains to language. Uh, we should actually randomize across all those sorts of stimulus factors, right? Um, and only these types of large-scale networks and large-scale collaborations provide the opportunity to do so and to start thinking about well, how should we implement a study like that where we have radically randomized all these sorts of factors. Good. Um, I think these are the sorts of points that came up uh, during our introduction and will come up later during discussions as well. Um, uh, one of the other things I like that I think is not an official project of the many babies is that we also have a teaching and training uh, Committee of Open Science, I think that's the official uh, name, but you know better. Um, so we're also promoting teaching and training in open science and uh, make sure that uh, researchers know about open science principles. Um, what I also like is that uh, 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 all of our projects uh, spend a lot of time documenting what's going on. So we all have large online resources about you know all the meetings that we had all the exchanges that there were all the arguments that were presented in favor of one or the other choice uh, and that doesn't only pertain to the final stimulus material and to the final design of the of the study but also about the process of getting there which is how do you collaborate um, and you know collaborating online with large groups of people is is not an easy task but we have gained much experience on how to do that and all of that is also documented 
uh, at least in part. Um, uh, for example, in authorship agreement or collaboration agreement documents that uh, can be used and adapted for your own project should you wish to do so. Good. Back to you. Um, I won't say anything about this, it's just a teaser on the um, last talk of this workshop where Francis will show you all the opportunities um, to, to get involved um, in, in many babies. Here, are, so the, um, here's the link to the website and also um, some other links. I guess when you s start from the website, you land up on every other um, repository. Um, there's a lot on OSF. Um, a lot on GitHub, um, where you can you kind of have a live view on, on the work that is being done in, in many babies. Um, do you have any questions? Um, I have one question. Oh, <laughs> maybe I start, I start with my question, sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm really interested in what uh, you want to take home from this workshop and we might be able to, to adapt um, so that um, you will be satisfied. Um, so what are you interested in especially? What do you want to learn or say or whatever? Um, yeah? Um, so we really d dive into, um, <laughs> dive really deeply into the, the workflow, that's great. The question was, um, how uh, do we discuss? Uh, there are Slack channels, so very sub-projects, and also, uh, I don't know, many babies too, analysis Slack channel where discussions take place. Um, but it's not the only way, because uh, we found out, like, I guess it's everywhere, there are some people uh, um, who don't or who, who didn't adapt to slack and are not using it unfortunately i'm i'm on that side of the <laughs> of the border as well um, we have uh, so we have a lot of opportunities let's put it like this so we have uh, traditional mailing lists where people send mails we discuss in google documents that's one example where everything is documented so when we resubmit our many babies to a um, manuscript and a reviewer says something about the paradigm, why this is done that way or the other. I'm really looking forward to that because I can scroll back to our Zoom meeting in uh, June 2019 and have all the arguments we had back then to make this particular design decision like that. Um, everything is, is there and it is documented. Um, it, yeah, we use the, the whole Google framework, we use Slack, what else? We use uh, GitHub for the coding stuff, where also discussions take place. Is that it? We used Zoom before Zoom became mainstream, <laughs> but I guess that's not a cool thing. <laughs> um, yeah. The second part, longitudinal. Um, I'm looking at the other many babies, folks. Uh, this is a really important question and should be done. And it's, um, I guess, collecting so much data from so many infants has a great potential um, of um, revisiting them or reinviting them. And samples might still be large. Do you know anything about that, Ingmar? I do. A little bit. Uh, so uh, Many Babies 1 had a longitudinal follow-up. I'm not sure what their sample size was. Many Babies 3 is planning a longitudinal follow-up. I'm not sure about the others. I don't not think yet. they are, not yet. Um, uh, so it provides this opportunity at least to do so, but I think your other question was about funding for longitudinal studies. And uh, well, funding generally for Many Babies is a tough issue. Uh, so far, I, I don't think many of the projects have had received any funding specifically for the project. There is funding for some of the support staff uh, at the Many Babies organizational level, uh, which is of great help uh, in organizing you know, all our meetings, all our materials, etc. So there's some support at the general level, but not for specific projects as far as I 
no, but maybe that's not true anymore. <laughs> uh, I, so I can speak a little bit to that. So my name is Francis. I'm um, uh, a co-lead for MB4. Um, so I, I would say a couple of exceptions to that is there, on the, on the Canadian side, uh, we have received a partnership development grant that is not really specifically tied to uh, a mini babies um, project, but is it, like we got re approval to kind of facilitate building these My networks. Name is um, so My it name kind of. Is yeah, the plan is to kind of set a precedence, um, kind of like a track record of success that we are getting the money and we're spending it wisely and hopefully we can um, have more ambitious projects um, going forward because um, something as large as Laundry Journal, um, uh, like at, at my lab we're running a local Laundry Journal project and it's already driving the PhD student crazy. So I can only imagine coordinating it across labs would be a, a massive undertaking that would require a, a lot of money probably from uh, from the U.S. side, because the Canadian government is, is, is pretty poor. Um, and the, the second thing I want to say is that we're in the process of resubmitting a, a, a proposal for um, a bigger version of the Partnership Development Grant to develop this many, many, uh, many, many network that Ingmar is talking about. And if this becomes successful, this is like one of the bigger Canadian fundings, um, and that can really help set the stage for using that to kind of leverage and get more funding for future Many Babies projects. Um, but I think without a, it's difficult because without a track record of success just yet, you know, on the, uh, on the money side, like we have great success in terms of like publications and put, pulling um, a bunch of grassroots um, labs together uh, and making good things happen. Um, but, you know, to get money, we, we have to prove that we can't get money, which is a weird circular argument. But I, I really look forward to that as well. I think adding to that maybe is that we also try to organize the projects in such a way that uh, that labs can contribute relatively small samples and, and, and have relatively small contributions, right? So that necessarily, it's not necessary to have funding, right? If you have a, an enthusiastic student who can spend a little bit of time on this, then they can already make a meaningful contributions and many meaningful contributions make, you know, big and fantastic projects. Um, for, for many babies too, we received funding from the um, German Research Foundation to collect large samples in, in the labs in, in Munich and in Göttingen um, with Hannes Rakocci and also for staff. We have a coordinating team that helps the whole project, but so far we haven't found a way of f giving money to individual labs to collect data. I guess that's the, the core issue there. Yeah? Um, how do we, so we said the problem is noisy data and we collect data from 16 infants in um, 60 labs and think this is n noisy. <laughs> uh, that's a, of course is a problem. Um, I, I'm looking at the time because I think your question will be answered um, throughout the next, throughout the next talks and we can put an emphasis on that because that's a really important point and we will present the ways to, to, to tackle that issue, I would say. Okay. Um, you had a question as well or is that? Or not? Or someone else? Yeah? Yeah, yeah.
Yeah, great. So we will, um, thanks a lot. We will try to fill that with anecdotes and how this is done. Um, I have some for, for many babies too. Um, the quick answer to your first question is uh, just jump in and uh, Francis will show you uh, how. <laughs> Um, I guess we should start with the first talk by Martin now. So we are in the next part of the workshop, which is update from the individual projects. And I hope it works, um, looks like it will. Um, Martin will present something on, um, because Many Babies 1 is kind of old now, and there's a main study, and there are multiple spin-off projects, and I hope we will get some insights on how that worked and what can be done with this um, tremendous amount of, of data. I'm a postdoc at Princeton University. Then I'm a postdoc uh, at Princeton I'm really disappointed University. that I can't be there with uh, you I'm really all disappointed today, that I can't be voice. there with you all today, uh, as you can probably hear from my voice. Uh, and uh, I got didn't COVID, feel up to travel, and, uh, also didn't seem wise to travel. Didn't feel up to travel, um, also didn't seem wise to travel. Yeah, and, uh, um, I was yeah, really and, looking forward to uh, seeing uh, a lot of you. I was really looking forward to seeing uh, a lot of you. Yeah, many being able to talk about the first time. Uh, many babies and being able to talk awesome about conference uh, many babies together. Awesome pre-conference um, that Tobias put together. Uh, so we'll um, just have to make it up some uh, other time. So we'll just have to make it up some other time. In the meantime, uh, I thought I'd still meantime, try and take a moment to uh, share a little bit. About, try and take a moment to uh, share a little bit about some of uh, the cool stuff that I think is going on. The cool stuff that I think is going on in so many babies one land. So if you've ever on the Many Babies uh, uh, website on this the Many Babies baby looking uh, back website, you, you this cute uh, baby you might have noticed that under each of the uh, you might have noticed many, many that under each of the often a bunch of other links project projects often a bunch of other What's links that all to about? other projects. Well, uh, if you click What's on that, that you'll about? find that well, there's actually uh, if you click on that, that you'll find that there's actually in the case of Many Babies one main project, especially in the case of Many Babies one, there's a ton of really interesting work that's been regular alphabet soup of other regular B one A of other projects in B one A and African infants, infant B one B or African African infants, B one G looking at case following, B one B one G longitudinal case following, B one L vocabulary longitudinal, B one N vocabulary following, native languages. And we want T yeah, test uh, retest languages. On. And we want T test retest it on. And on. It turns out that a lot of these and projects are starting to enter their final stages. They've been published. 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 They've been
um, going in there measure. was widespread agreement about going in there was widespread that, agreement. Yes, about it's a thing. It exists. That, IDS preference. Yes, it's a thing. It exists. IDS and preference. That it's you think that's really important in the course of language development? Probably important. Some interesting in the course of language development there, but some interesting theoretical disagreements there. But that for the most part, phenomenon widespread agreement that it's an important. And another thing is that there was a large effect size. And another thing is that there was a large effect size document. There was one meta analysis. There was one meta analysis. Effect size of Dunstan colleagues have found. Remember that number. It's going to become six seven. Relevant. Remember that number. It's going to become relevant. Uh, in just right. a little bit. To give you like a whirlwind kind of right. uh, overview like over, uh, kind of, kind of, uh, uh, over how um, the Many Babies 1 project In a way, it's kind of three um, studies in one because in a way, it's three kind of three studies in one because three, three different methods were used. I don't have time to go into a huge amount of detail about, about, about the important thing to know is that 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 the two that use a central screen and measures central attention towards that screen and measures infant's attention towards that screen while or either an infant directed speech stimulus was playing or an adult directed so that would be central fixation eye tracking. So that would be central fixation eye tracking. And then the one method that was, um, and then the more fundamentally different was the head turn um, preference procedure. The more fundamentally different was the head turn preference procedure. That kind of train infants to look to either side. That kind of train infants to look to either side. To look to either side. Side. And then you measure how much they prefer to turn their heads and listen to. Prefer to turn their heads and listen to either an infant directed speech stimulus or an adult directed. So a lab tested infants in one of these three methods. So a lab tested infants in one of these three methods. When it came to the stimuli, all the stimuli were. When it came to the stimuli, all the stimuli were conversations between parents and infants from. Conversations with speech, parents and infants, parents for another adult speech, or parents of adult directed speech. In North America, case adult directed speech, a big decision that's worthy of a lot more discussion. Decision that's worthy of a lot more discussion. I won't get into it a ton today. In total, there were 16 total. There were half. Uh, uh, directed trials, uh, half adult directed, infant directed uh, speech, uh, half ADS, adult directed uh, speech, and for IDS, the most part, yes, you know, and if you haven't heard IDS before, you know, I'm sure you haven't heard IDS before, like, I'm really I'm sure, you know I'm sure in some way, I'm really sure, sure have, I'm sure in some way, you have some idea of what you've been directed speech Basically, that's how you should picture these stimuli too. Basically, that's how you should picture these stimuli too. I'm going to be mortifying, I'm sure. Gonna be All right, mortifying. and uh, the final sample for many babies. All right, one, and uh, uh, the final sample was, for many babies. Man, one, uh, such an achievement. It was um, from man, all the people uh, such who an achievement. This project, um, from all the people who led this project, sixty-nine labs contributed data. Sixty-nine huge contribution labs effort, contributed data um, from so many um, effort um, researchers. From so many across um, seventeen countries. Researchers led to across seventeen countries. Um, incredible sample led to over two thousand. Um, incredible sample of two thousand over two thousand. You also notice, you know, on this. You also notice, you know, a lot of geographic gaps here. Plot right. There's also a lot of geographic gaps here. Probably gives you an idea why there are follow-up projects. Probably gives you an idea why. There are follow-up um, projects like that and really try to make an effort to um, test if it's in Africa, to make an effort to test if it's in Africa, for example. Okay, the big takeaway was I think uh, okay, the big takeaway was really, I think um, a large scale success, really. of um, a large preference. scale replication among that of infant sample of preference. over 2000 um, infants sample there was an overall 2000 infants preference um, there was an overall infant directed speech um, over adult preference speech for about 0.35 over so adult directed speech about 0.35 so effect size You'll notice, um, about half the size of that meta analytic, about half the size of that meta analytic showed you earlier that I, that I um, which is also earlier interesting, right? Um, which is um, also interesting, right? Some of the key takeaways was that this effect was also moderated by several factors. Some of the key takeaways was that this effect was also moderated by several interesting factors. Uh, one was method. So it turned out that the head turn preference uh, method, so, so it turned out that the head turn preference method, so that's the one name says, that that yielded the largest effect of about 0.5, that yielded the largest effect of about 0.5, central fixation eye tracking and an effect about central fixation eye tracking and an effect smaller. 0.2, 0.25, and smaller. there were also moderation effects of age and, and experience. There were also so moderation effects of age and language experience. You that. So here's a quick um, plot to kind of what that did look like. Um, and IDS what that preference like um, increase with IDS age. preference um, increase so with age. So that's what you can kind of see along the um, x-axis. So that's see, what you can kind of see along the x-axis. Actually, from see, it's a pretty young 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 large age range. About actually, from three or four months age range to around uh, three or four months months to around uh, fourteen fifteen months. And um, there was also an increase. You can kind of see and, that at two facets. There was also an increase. A larger effect for instance. A larger effect for instance. Who were uh, growing up in North American who, English uh, uh, compared to were adults not. who and remember the stimuli uh, were, were not presented. And remember the stimuli English were so one in, presented uh, in North American English interpretation. So one is that uh, the straightforward interpretation is that this is a language experience uh, effect. Right? I'll just say as a quick aside here too that uh, there are some really I'll just say as a quick aside here too that there are also some really uh, intriguing uh, continuous effects native language of, exposure in MB one native language exposure in looking at MB one bilingual infants we're not looking at bilingual bilingual infants where the effect increases as bilingual infants increases. As more bilingual infants North American have English exposure more among the North American English two languages exposure that they among have the exposure to two languages that they have exposure to. Okay, so the key takeaways from many babies. One, okay, so uh, the key uh, takeaways from many babies. One, one moderate uh, effect size of uh, infant directed speech preference. preference. Moderate effect size is a variation of cross methods. Larger effect is a variation of cross methods. Larger effect is a increase with age and IDS preference. You know, I just want to stress here that and that was not. You know, I just want to stress here that that was not going in. Some folks might have. In fact, I think going in, some folks might have strongly consistent predicted from early on a strongly consistent effect. 
ranges early because on from the we think that this effect ranges is, because um, we think that this effect uh, relevant is from um, when infants are born, uh, right? Relevant or even that it might decrease when infants are born, age, right? Or um, even that it might right? decrease less relevant age, as um, infants right? grow older and get more experience with infants grow older and get more experience with language. And we also found, uh, in fact, larger effects. For and we also found with, uh, first language uh, fact, larger effects for infants uh, with first language experience in North American English. All right. So this right. is where we transition um, to me telling you about two. So this is where we transition to me telling you about that, two uh, spin-off projects that I think that are uh, providing uh, that I think more are in, uh, relevant, interesting data about infant directed speech relevant, preference. Relevant, interesting so data is about infant directed speech preference. A mega analysis, first is called of infant directed speech preference. Mega analysis, here is called of infant directed speech preference. Some of the other shout out key contributors here, some of the other first authors, key contributors here, my senior author on the pie, senior author on the pie, is really instrumental in this work. Is really instrumental in this work. So here's what we did. So here's we, what we did. Uh, uh, basically, we did an update uh, to um, basically the previous meta analysis by Dunstan colleagues. Um, the previous meta analysis by Dunstan also coding a bunch of I moderators. Um, also coding a bunch of moderators. Studies. Um, and among then these studies, compared that data to and then the many babies one study. That here I'm giving you just this overwhelming many snapshot. Of here I'm giving you just this overwhelming effect snapshot that now went into this analysis. Effect sizes that now went into this analysis. So a ton of data on basically collated IDS preferences. Basically collated in this paper. Uh, summarize what are the main takeaways paper what are the main so, takeaways one exciting result so, is that actually exciting meta result is and that actually many babies one meta analytic almost and the many babies one identical are almost um, so red identical. is the many babies one data um, so red is uh, blue the many babies one data is the distribution uh, blue of blue are for, is the distribution uh, the meta analysis uh, the for the dash uh, line meta analysis the dash line represents the um, for both average uh, estimate from either the replications uh, or from the uh, from meta analysis replications or from the uh, sorry meta analysis replications, replications here many babies sorry one. just to clarify replications being you might be wondering one. what where's the uh, you might be wondering blue what? dash line where's the well, uh, it's blue right behind the red dash line, line because well, it turns out it's right the behind the red dash line uh, average effect it turns sizes out are that the two uh, average effect sizes are both 0.35 i was kind of floored when i saw this point and remember that the starting place for the meta analysis and remember that the starting place for the meta effect size almost twice as large an effect size almost twice as large there's a longer story to tell about how this a longer story to tell about how this updated meta analysis half the size of the possibly an effect size half the size of the kind of starting place makes a big difference i should say to add a lot of different papers to to add a lot of additional um, papers um, have been added that, to the literature um, um have been added and, to the literature uh, a big part of the story um, too is and uh, that big part of the story too corrected a lot of that we uh, corrected we a lot of uh, mistakes uh, in the original what we meta considered to be mistakes there the if i was there for the q and a i'd be excited there, to talk if I was there for the q and a a detective work excited that to talk into more about the detective work that went into okay so that's kind of cool that means analysis we should be really confident that we have a good idea we should be really confident that we have a good idea about what effect size to expect size preference in general what effect size to expect you know preference in general variability of course you know, especially there's a lot of variability in the meta analysis, in especially in the sort of effect sizes we see in the literature. In terms of what sort of effect sizes we see in the literature. But there's another twist, which is that um, but there's another twist, there was, which is that um, no consistency. There was in no a lot of the key moderator effects that I just showed you. A lot of the key moderator one, effects. No that I just showed you between many babies what one, we found in many babies. No consistency one, between what we found in, what we in many babies one and what we found so this in plot the analysis. summarizing. So there's a big inconsistency summarizing the moderator effects. Inconsistency data sources and the moderator effects by the two data sources. So remember that many babies one. We saw this. So remember that many babies increasing with age. Age effect with you don't see that increasing with age. You might be wondering. Don't see that the meta analysis. You might be wondering. Even if you were stretching down wider in the meta analysis, even if you were stretching down age range to the many you see a similar, one age range, uh, no, you no see a effect. similar, uh, no, no effect. There was a uh, stronger effect in HP. There was a uh, stronger effect in many HP babies one. in the heterogeneous preference procedure uh, uh, many babies compared one. to other methods. Compared, uh, um, we see if anything to other methods. Um, we see if anything uh, going the opposite direction in the meta analysis. Um, uh, so no consistency direction in the meta analysis. So no consistency there. We also don't see and the same direction of effect. We also don't see the same of direction of first effect language or native language of experience. First language or native language in many babies one when we look see in many babies one. Okay, so that's. Okay, that's so kind of interesting that we don't uh, see consistent effects. That's kind of interesting that we don't see the source effects between these two big. I'll just say the quick aside that we also. I'll just say the quick aside that we also have enough data. Found that we just really didn't cross the two data sources for meaningful um, comparisons between the other moderators that we were interested in. Many of the other moderators that we were interested in. Limitations, despite the fact we have so much data. Limitations, there's still some questions that we don't have enough data yet. There's still some questions that we just don't have enough data yet to answer. So just to summarize the quick take homes. So just to summarize the quick take homes one data. The meta actually analytic are and the main almost data spookily actually are identical, in almost spookily uh, uh, agreement. identical. Uh, uh, they both find effect size uh, agreement three five. Uh, they both find effect size about point three five. But effects are inconsistent but between data sources. Moderator effects are inconsistent. And there's still lots of residual uncertainty here. So and there's still lots of residual uncertainty. We just don't have enough data in many lots, cases to. Uh, we just don't have enough data in really robustly to test and generalize uh, the influence really of many test and generalize the influence of moderators that we cared about across the moderators that we cared about across the two data sets. All right. So.
Uh, what right. about so? Uh, uh, what about spinoff project uh, that I promised the you? Other spinoff project so, uh, that I promised that you. is many babies one so, T. Uh, that is test retest many babies one T. Uh, test retest reliability of infrared speech so preference. So the starting point for this kind of project is. Um, so the starting point for this kind of project is that um, we kind of question are really interested in answering. We are really um, interested in answering not just language development, but um, in studying infants in general. Language development, but in studying infants in general. Here's the structure of that question. Here's the structure of that question. ability at time point one. Does predict ability some later outcome, outcome that we care about predict down the line. some later outcome whenever we ask a question down the line. like um, whenever we ask a question we make a claim like like um, if we make a claim, uh, preference like for infant, infant speech uh, has downstream consequences for language speech development. Has downstream that consequences is a claim that has this kind of structure, right? That their preference is a claim that has this kind of structure, right? Predict their preference at time point one. Predict now, some later outcome. A really now important a really prerequisite for that important for our ability to make those kinds of predictions for our ability to make those kinds of predictions. Individual we have a good estimate time one of individual events at time one. In other words, goes into a measure of being good, of course, right? There's a lot goes into a necessary good, of course, right? But one that is necessary that we have a robust reliable. That we have a uh, robust the ability or the preference, uh, uh, the, the ability of the infant preference at time point one. Uh, the behavior of the infant at time. So many babies point one seems like a great opportunity to. So many assess, babies one seems like a great um, opportunity the, to assess uh, test retest reliability. Um, the uh, test retest reliability speech preference. Uh, so the idea here was to bring in infants again. So the idea here was to bring in infants another again. test session for usually about um, one or two weeks. Another after test session, session one. usually about one or two weeks after using the same methods as many babies one. Using the same methods as many babies one. Procedure. They were assessed in preference procedure again. They were assessed in entering preference procedure again. Retest stimuli. So the um, the retest stimuli were constructed uh, based on stimuli for the second session uh, the same raw recordings that were used in session one. The same raw recordings that were used in session one. The same recordings that were used the same auditory recordings that were used in just session one. Uh, Jumbled up in a particular way. There's that's an interesting decision in way. Right. That's an interesting decision is on right. That is worth discussing. Check out the paper for some discussion. Is worth discussing. Check out the paper for some discussion of that. And then the other thing to know is that. And then the other thing to know is there's a much smaller sample here. There's a few different. There's a much smaller sample here. I want to stress that. Different reasons for that. But I want to stress that just even hundred with just sixty infants roughly in this sixty infants roughly in this. That's still nothing to sneeze at. Data set that's quite a lot. That's still nothing to sneeze at. That's still quite a lot. The question is. Right is uh, the question is in session right one, is correlated uh, IDS preference, IDS preference session one session correlated with IDS preference. Here's session a quick two. overview over that that sample. Here's a quick overview um, over the, that, that sample. Fifty-eight um, infants who ultimately ended up in the sample. Who ultimately ended up in the sample. So what do we find? Uh, uh, so what do we find? Unfortunately, uh, we found basically no evidence overall. We found test basically no evidence overall relation to test retest nine. Not relation of and this is not sort of respecting not um, and this is not uh, sort of not independence um, due to uh, not data, independence uh, different labs contributing data data uh, different labs but we also don't data. see correlations but we also don't see any of the correlations within any of the individual labs, uh, any of the individual labs. Uh, uh, one either. way that you can uh, get an overview of this one way is, that you can uh, do an overview meta analytic is estimate and uh, you can see meta analytic meta analytic estimate is basically that distinguishable from meta analytic estimate is basically distinguishable from relation between IDS preference measured at session one between IDS IDS measured at session one and IDS preference measured at session two. One of the more hopeful results that we found was that one of the more hopeful results that we found was that there might be some benefit, to, requiring be some benefit kind of to requiring sense, right? more you, trials. Um, it's kind of makes sense, right? Increasing number of trials that means you have more information about individual trials. Infants. That means you have more so, information about uh, individual infants. In principle, so, you have a better uh, uh, as principle, of, you have a better that individual uh, estimate. Uh, so what we did here is sequentially increase the number of trials. What we did here is sequentially increase the number of trials required. You can see and it's not the best plot for this resolution, but you can see the plot picture for this going up a little bit. You can see the relation to around going up a little bit to five around three. To around point, but if I apply my magnifying glass here and help, if I apply my magnifying glass here, at that point we're down to how small the samples got. At that point we're down to twenty. Really, just much too high attrition. Really, just get much too high attrition in order to get even a correlation. Here's another plot to kind of illustrate this in a more fine way. Here's another plot to kind of illustrate this in a more fine way. On the x-axis, I'm going to use session required for inclusion. On the y-axis, session required for inclusion. Coefficient zero is of course no correlation. Coefficient session zero is of course no. And what we find is that at some point you kind of reach a point. And what we find is that at some point you kind of reach a point. Where, to look like there's uh, some signal it's there, there, right? At the to very look end. like there's some signal and, there, right? At the very end. But even at that and, point, you know. But even at that point, I guess you only lost. You've only lost a third of the sample. I guess you only lost a third of the sample. But the key takeaway here is that even here, that correlation is just. The key takeaway here is that even here, that correlation is just point two five. Really small. It's still only much 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 too low. Point three five. Really much 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 too low. Standard. I really would want any reliability standard that you would want to would be make individual difference research. Make individual difference research. So one question is.
Is there robust so one signal? Question is anywhere? Is there robust in the data? Anywhere? And one in the data. Interesting and thing one is that looking times themselves is are in fact looking correlated. times themselves so are the in fact highly preference correlated. measure, which is so that it doesn't preference that you measure analyze this in different ways. All doesn't give a similar result to the one I showed you. All of them give a similar result to the one I showed you. But, result between, 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 but it's a directed speech preference. A difference between speech preference. directed speech preference and that has no speech preference correlation from session one to session two. But what does from session one to session two? But what does and that's also true looking times and that's also true for um. ADS and uh, IDS stimuli for ADS uh, and IDS stimuli. What happens uh, to those separate. correlations? What happens um, to those really correlations? Interesting question um, is a really and, interesting uh, question. I, and I encourage you, uh, since I won't be there for QA, I, I encourage you to take a peek at the paper. Since I won't be there for QA, I encourage you to take a peek at the paper. Why it is about that, you know, overall looking why it times are reliable. But overall looking times measure reliable, that's derived from those looking times, the preference measure that's derived from those looking times subsequently isn't. We have some thoughts. All right, so the key takeaways here is that are that. All right, so the key takeaways here is that are that we test reliability and no strong evidence for test retest reliability and infinite speech preference. Even under the best case scenarios, there was really high attrition rate scenarios and the correlations were just really high attrition rate small and the correlations were just in the most too optimistic small, even reading of the data in the most optimistic reading so of the, the data the takeaway here is that likely we just so have that the very takeaway here is that individual likely differences have very limited outcomes, outcomes based individual on individual differences um, in future outcomes time measures based on of um, even directed looking time measures of the end i just want to speech press um, Say the end. I just want a few words of acknowledgement. Um, first of all, say a few uh, words if you're not of acknowledgement. First of all, I just want to say, uh, man, there's if you're not a ton of many games already. I just want to say, man, there's on. a ton of definitely feel, exciting projects um, going on. Uh, free to reach out um, to any of the many uh, free to reach out to and get involved. Many folks in this room. This is some of the most and get involved. Exciting science. This is some of the most a part of exciting science that I've been a part of. I've been lucky enough to be a part of. I want to say thank you to. I want to say thank uh, you to the leads, leads, especially um, the leads of many uh, babies. One leads, project that I mentioned today, so of many babies. Mike one Melanie, I mentioned today, Chris, so Mike, Mike, Melanie, Christina, Chris, um, my Melanie, Melanie, Melanie Schreiner, the um, other Melanie leader for Schreiner, the many babies. Uh, one test retest leader for all the many many one test retest in lots of ways. All the many many folks many babies many babies. One of ways. Shout out Heidi, babies and many babies. Our awesome executive director in the governing board. Our awesome executive director in the governing board helps support many babies. One of some of the funding that helps support many. Very sad that I can't do a Q and A now. Very sad that I can't do a Q and A now. But do feel free to email me if you have any questions or thoughts. Bye. Sorry, one second. Um. Okay, so um, this one, this one, this one. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Um, unfortunately, we can't talk to Martin, but I think this um, gave a, a good impression of what can be done with this data. So many of those um, um, study ideas um, weren't there from the beginning, but came during the process. And because it's all there, this can be done, and a lot of new people jump in. So it's still time to get involved in Many Babies One, although this started quite some years ago. Um, I will continue with uh, Many Babies 2, Theory of Mind and Infancy. Um, uh, this is a, it's really hard to find good examples of, of um, false belief tasks. I won't show it to you because I guess you all know how that works. Um, right? <laughs> okay. Um, here you see a really ancient but, but important uh, graph of a meta-analysis on the acquisition of theory of mind with these sometimes called explicit tasks or verbal theory of mind tasks, so where the 
child is asked, where do you think Sally um, um, thinks the marble is or whatever? And you can see that um, between ages um, three and five, they um, acquire this ability. This is a quite a robust um, finding. Um, Later, I guess even before, um, people started um, um, asking, um, but uh, aren't younger children um, competent in doing this? You, can, you see some, yeah, th th there might be some evidence that they can do this before age three. There are some doubts when you see, at, when you look at these toddlers playing hide and seek and thinking that they cannot be seen, but um, there are here three examples of um, three really important and influential um, paradigms that tested um, theory of mind, especially false belief understanding in children younger than three, and found evidence for that. Um, I won't go into detail and explain all these tasks. I will explain the second one, the anticipatory looking false belief task, because this is the first focus of the Many Babies 2 project. Um, so really important and influential studies. The problem here is that um, starting in 2017, I would say the many um, uh, partial replications or non-replications of um, these findings were published using either um, the direct replications with the exact stimuli or um, own design stimuli, but with the same idea behind this. Um, this is a, those are graphs from a meta-analysis by Barone et al. in 2019. What you see um, here on the left side is those dots are individual studies. Bigger dots are studies with, bigger, with larger sample sizes and small dots are small sample sizes. Um, and usually not the replication efforts, but the original studies. What you see here is that the effect decreases um, with um, larger studies uh, and replication um, attempts. And the um, right one is a final plot that shows you, um, so if all those dots again are individual studies. If they would be in that white triangle, that would be evidence for an indicator of no publication bias. What you see here is that there are a lot of um, large studies, which are more on the top, um, that don't find the effect, and a lot of small studies um, amongst them original studies that um, find a large effect, and you get this kind of um, yeah, uneven distortion of um, of those um, standard errors and observed outcomes. So um, the, um, it, it, we don't really know yet whether um, young children um, below age four or even below age three um, have an understanding of other people's minds and especially of their false beliefs. Um, Many Babies 2 um, addresses this issue. Um, I am coordinating this project together with uh, Dora Kampes, she's also here on the conference, um, with Hannes Rakocci in Göttingen and Mike Frank, um, the, um, we mentioned him before. Um, before jumping right to the false belief, true belief replication, um, we have to do something else um, and I will um, walk you through that process. We are doing this quite, of, quite thoroughly, which takes a lot of time. <laughs> um, that's a caveat when, when you say I'm a PhD student and I want to jump into that. It might take um, years and you might be finished with your PhD <laughs> until anything is, is done. But um, you can be part of a part of the project and be acknowledged for it and um, I don't know make friends, learn something, and contribute. Um, so in the first step, project one, we decided to uh, try to conceptually replicate those anticipatory looking false belief tasks, which are eye-tracking tasks with, with a standardized stimuli that can be shown on the screen everywhere around the world and measured with um, 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 eye trackers, uh, no language involved, that's quite good to implement in many labs and have it quite standardized. Um, that's the age range we agreed, we agreed on, and those are the paradigms that were kind of the, the ingredients for, for our um, stimulus design. 
Um, a problem of previous uh, studies and especially replication attempts was that um, in th those tasks measure anticipatory looking. Um, and I will show you, uh, I'm showing you the video right now. I really, I dream of these two guys. Um, and I can't see it anymore, but it is important. <laughs> so this is um, the general idea behind it. Um, there are two agents. Um, the scene is introduced, so they play. This is some kind of hide-and-seek scenario. Um, you learn that they take this tunnel to get into one of those boxes and hide, and that the goal of the other one is um, Get it. The goal of the bear is to get the mouse. You also see that there's a fence that can be passed, can be passed, so um, they have to take the tunnel, and they are happy when they are reunited. Um, that's a familiarization try to establish all those things. What we measure is um, anticipatory looking um, during the time the bear is during the time the bear is in the tunnel where nothing happens to measure whether the participants predict um, where the bear will exit the tunnel, which is a measure of um, um, goal-based goal um, yeah, action anticipation um, and, and a goal tracking of that agent. Um, in a first step, because it was a problem of replication attempts, that the anticipation rates were low um, in general, so they s similarly seemed not to be um, engaging enough um, even in familiarization, and a lot of um, toddlers um, had to be excluded from those um, uh, further analysis. So we uh, had to make sure that our newly developed stimuli um, are engaging enough. Um, we ran two pilot studies um, for this. This was before COVID. The second one with N13, this was right when COVID hit, so we had to stop, but um, it was... Um, um, enough to... to, um, to, to um, continue. What you can see here is really briefly that the anticipation rate was fairly um, robust and, and high enough. So we said, okay, they do anticipate um, simple goal-directed actions. Let's go on and manipulate what the agent thinks in that situation. Um, this is not yet the false belief, true belief study, which is the most important, interesting thing. We haven't even started with that. This is, it can be seen as kind of a intermediate uh, conceptual step um, because uh, we can only um, um, thoroughly interpret the false belief, true belief um, findings when we know that um, here in this case toddlers and adults um, track epistemic states of those agents um, and here we decided to go for simpler epistemic states, states which are um, knowing or not knowing something. Um, and only if we find evidence for that. That was the idea. We can go on whether they also track um, a false belief or a true belief of an agent. Um, here are the conditions. So one last time, these are the test trials. So um, they watch four familiarization trials and then a first test trial, which can be this knowledge condition in which the bear um, sees where the mouse ends up then briefly leaves the scene. I will explain why this is uh, in a second. Watches how the mou mouse goes into the other box, and then enters the tunnel. Um, in the ignorance condition, Um, the same happens, and overall, um, the events are exactly the same between the two conditions, just the timings are slightly different, so that the bear ends up with a different epistemic state about the whereabouts of the, of the mouse, which is now the bear doesn't witness how mouse enters box one, and also doesn't witness how mouse enters box two, so bear is super ignorant about the whereabouts of the mouse. So the one condition, Bear knows, second condition, bear doesn't know. It's controlled for leaving the scene um, to have a match here to um, um, avoid alternative explanations. This is the setup of the, um, of the study. 
<laughs> not, not impaired, that's even worse. <laughs> um, yeah, so our prediction would be a strong looking bias towards the um, tunnel exit that's important, not the box, but the tunnel exit where the bear will reappear. Um, when um, he or she wants to find the mouse, which would be in that case the left tunnel exit. Um, it's kind of misleading that the boxes are um, highlighted here. Whereas in the ignorance condition, there should be a strong looking bias to either side because Bear doesn't really know um, anything about um, where the mouse is. That's the, those are the hypotheses. Um, <laughs> um, really <laughs> crowded. Uh, figures, but um, that's also to make the point that it is um, messy and difficult and uh, labor intense. Um, so um, we collected, so th th this was a registered report. Um, uh, we, after acceptance, um, we made a worldwide call and 35 labs from 15 countries um, managed to, to collect data and participate. We collected data from 582 um, toddlers and 650 adults. Um, we are really happy that we, this exceeds the anticipated uh, number of participants we, we promised to the journal. So that's uh, really great and we are super happy. Um, you can see here this, oh, you can see, but this is a, a nightmare um, a Google Sheet um, table. And this um, shows the, um, so each, each line is a lab and their way to getting started. So labs said okay, said, okay, I'm here, I want to participate. Then labs had to fill questionnaires, what eye tracker they use, how many children, how many adults they want to test and stuff like that, how their lab looks. Um, they filled author contributions, they had to read the lab manual and um, answer them some questions there. What else, Mar Marina? So the one important thing is for standardization, they had to send us a walkthrough video of their lab um, of one example or pilot or even mock testing. So they filmed it with their camera, how they, um, in, how they uh, greet the child and put it in the um, eye tracking um, setup, um, show the stimuli, the whole stuff. And it was checked by the coordination team. And when this was uh, fine, according to some criteria, they got their green light and they were um, allowed to test, um, so to stay, or to, to start testing. And some more um, intermediate steps to control that it is as parallel as possible. The lab manual has how many pages? A lot of pages. Um, it's really <laughs> complicated and very detailed, but it gives you a super detailed instruction. And that, this is so. The, the upside is we have a super detailed documentation of how we how we did this, of how it has been done, and we had to think in advance about all the problems and issues that might come up and how they can be solved. So it, it helped up to it helped up to us to identify a lot of bugs before testing and not after testing 600 um, toddlers, which would have been a nightmare. Um, I'm looking to Marina a lot of the time because she was part of the coordination team and um, had a lot of conversations, a lot of e um, emails um, with the individual labs asking questions that could have been answered by reading the lab manual, but also other questions. But this is yeah, just the, the part that has to be done to get so many people on, on track. The other one was Lucy Zimmer from Munich. Um, she spent a lot, many, many hours in getting those labs ready to test. Um, the second um, screenshot here is from uh, th this just uh, this exemplifies the data analysis procedure. We had a dedicated data analysis team um, that developed um, a pre-processing pipeline to pre-process raw data from different eye trackers. So that's we said eye tracking is quite standardized. Um, you collect data um, x y coordinates from the eyes. Um, that's one part. The other part is there are different manufacturers, there are different recording softwares, there are different screen sizes, different sampling rates whatsoever. Um, we still wanted to um, uh, be able to analyze raw data, um, f so throw in all the raw data, raw data from all the different eye trackers and setups and jointly analyze that data. Um, this has been done by M Martin. 
Adrian, Gail, Mike, Alvin and Jan Wei, they spend a lot of um, hours trying to make sense of, of um, the data that has been sent in and getting meaningful results out of this. And this is a process that is still um, ongoing. Again, we have another thing is a data validator. Francis, you are um, the boss of that, I guess. Um, it's, a, it's a small, shiny app, is it? Um, that um, checks, so um, when um, people send in their data, they send it in a CSV file, for example, and it has to, they have to upload it to this data validator that automatically checks whether the format is correct, whether the column names are correct, whether the number of columns is correct, and other criteria, and gives you an error message um, when it's not correct. So it forces the labs to um, fix their uh, mistakes before it has to be done centralized. So this is another kind of gate to get uh, clean data and save a lot of time. Um, I am now showing you um, results uh, some first results of a subsample of the eye tracking data. As I said, this is ongoing and this is data of 250 toddlers and 270 adults, so about a third of the overall sample. And those slides are not um, super polished yet, um, but I'll walk you through. This is from, the, so question one was, um, does familiarization work? So do they anticipate goal-directed actions. Bayer knows everything, there is no evidence that Bayer might have no access to any information. Do they anticipate that? Um, the quick answer is yes. What you see here is the, um, that's the timeline of the trial I showed you, and zero is the point of disambiguation. That's the point where the bear um, exits the tunnel, so where it becomes clear whether the bear comes out on the left or the right side. And the time to the next dotted line is the anticipatory, anticipatory period, so the, our um, time point of interest, where nothing happens, where we measure expectations of the participants. Uh, green line is um, looking to the target, which is what we want. Target is the correct tunnel exit in the particular trial. And um, red line is looking to the distractor, which is the other tunnel exit. And if the blue line is above the red line, we are happy. Um, and if it's statistically significant, we are um, even happier. This means they are anticipating correctly where the bear will um, reappear. And what you can see here is that both adults and toddlers are doing this. I, uh, at this point, I won't go into detail about any potential difference, but just uh, first check, yes, they are anticipating in that, um, in, in that paradigm. Here are the results of the first test trial. Um, that's a between participants design. They e either saw knowledge or ignorance trials. And those are the results of the adults. What you can see here is that in the blue, the knowledge condition, um, so everything above um, um, the 50% line is a looking bias towards the correct location, so they are anticipating based on the knowledge state of the bear. Um, um, they are doing this in the knowledge condition, and they are not doing this in the ignorance condition. So this is kind of the predicted effect. Um, they are differentiating between the epistemic states of the bear and also in the way that they can use it to correctly predict the action outcome in the knowledge condition um, and not in the ignorance condition. Um, a side note, this is um, significantly below chance. This, um, there is some literature that shows um, that there might be a strategy that not seeing meets, leads to mistakes which might um, lead participants to, that's yeah, a really very, very preliminary and cautious interpretation, but there is um, um, previous um, data and our previous studies on that showing that um, this might uh, lead participants to think there is a mistake, um, so look to the wrong um, direction because the bear will do it wrongly. Um, this is the data for the toddlers and here the effect is flipped. <laughs> and we were super shocked, um, of course, thought this is a, a bug in analysis, maybe we, I mean, we could just switch the labels of the conditions and <laughs> then we are happy. <laughs> um, but this wasn't the case here. Um, and this is where we are at, at the moment. Um, so we are kind of, 
this is why I have I mean, I'm so afraid of results. <laughs> um, but in the end, I guess those results are the ones that uh, make you smarter because you have to find out wh why and learn new stuff. And this is the process we are starting now. So this is just really puzzling, especially that they are, have a, such a strong looking bias towards the correct location and the ignorance condition. So if knowledge would be around zero, that's fine. Toddlers might not yet get it or whatever. But why is this super strong bias towards the, uh, the, the correct location in the ignorance condition. We have no clue yet. Um, this is a um, time course plot um, of the same finding I showed you on the previous slide. Um, the, what you can see here is on the left side are the adults, on the right side the toddlers, again this anticipatory period. And I did not mention this to not make it too, more, too complicated. We have a second test trial to have this also as a within participant design. Um, the dotted line is the first test trial I showed you before, and the solid line is the second test trial, um, which I won't interpret at that point. But what you can see here is that um, in the adults, we have the predicted um, pattern. Um, so blue line is or green line is above the red line, so they anticipate um, as expected in the knowledge condition and not so much in the ignorance condition. What you can see here is, or what might be interesting for follow-up analysis, that in the, so those are four seconds, which is quite long. In the first two seconds, it looks like um, there might be a bias towards the correct location in the knowledge condition in toddlers, but this somehow disappears later. Again, very, very preliminary. Um, why there is uh, this doesn't. This story doesn't still doesn't explain the ignorance performance. Um, we just have to dive more deeply into into the data and see what is going on there. Sorry. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, um, so we will look at potential age effects. Um, what role um, familiarization trials play? And if this pattern remains stable, there might be um, um, some previous literature showing that children at that age um, um, cannot differentiate between ignorance and sham ignorance conditions. Those are pretty much details, but there are other studies showing that pattern of results, which might help to explain that. And last, last slide. There is still a chance to, um, to join the project. Just send us a mail, and we will um, put you in the project. Thank you very much. Um, we started 10 minutes later. Um, I don't know what's five minutes later, 15 minutes later. Yeah. Um, Um, sorry, we are running late, so um, I, I hope you have any questions. Please um, ask me them in the, in the break or, or somewhere um, later in the conference. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> you want to join? Or <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the word anyway. So again, my uh, Ingmar Fischer uh, and presenting this together with Clarke Leveld about uh, Many uh, Babies Tree that was initially conceived to be about uh, uh, statistical learning and then turned into rule learning. Uh, in the timeline, maybe you noted that it was first called statistical learning uh, and then became rule learning. Uh, in any case, so um, it's, about, um, uh, it's about a classical result by uh, Gary Marcus, uh, published in uh, 1999, um, um, about uh, infants' ability to generalize uh, linguistic rules. Um, so with patterns of ABB or ABA. Uh, so infants are familiarized with uh, some of these patterns, uh, ABB patterns such as lay, way, way or GJJ. Uh, they hear many of these patterns uh, and then they're being exposed to 
uh, new sequences um, uh, which either follow the same pattern, the ABB pattern, or they follow a different pattern, the AB, uh, A pattern, such as lay, way, lay. Um, so, uh, and the question is, you know, can they can they generalize this uh, uh, this sequence sequential structure that they have been familiarized to uh, in the familiarization phase. And so in the original results, uh, uh, the, uh, Marcus found a very large effect size. Uh, 15 out of 16 infants uh, showed the effect. Um, uh, and this is thought to be uh, an interesting or an important result in all sorts of uh, ways. Um, so in Many Babies 3, uh, we're studying this question uh, because of many reasons. Uh, and we're also including a bunch of uh, collaborator uh, or uh, um, um, uh, moderator effects, uh, such as age, uh, experimental paradigm, and linguistic background. I'll get back to the theoretical background uh, a little more after this. Um, um, yeah, so, uh, so who's not familiar with rule learning? Do you want to show this a little bit? Why not? I can show this. If it's running. So this is a very cute and well-behaved infant in, the, in this head turn preference uh, paradigm. Uh, whenever the pattern is playing, they're looking left or right, and uh, whenever they stop paying attention, they're being refocused to the middle, um, and then the next trial starts. Um, no. Yes, next. Uh, so, as I said, the uh, rule learning is considered to be important in many ways. So, the idea of rule learning or rule following or being able to represent rules plays a major role in all sorts of um, uh, theories or foundations of cognitive science. Um, so, it plays a role in, in category learning and category representations, in conceptual development, in conceptual representations, such as in uh, these um, category learning examples. Uh, it plays a major role in the notion of a cognitive architecture. What is, you know, what's going on inside our minds consists of rules and rules being followed by people um, to, uh, to reach their goals or to learn language. Um, so it's an important concept and hence it's also important to find out well at what stage during development are infants or children able to uh, acquire this idea of uh, rules. Um, so uh, another more pragmatic reason to want to replicate uh, the classical finding by uh, Marcus is that um, uh, there was a, a meta-analysis uh, here that uh, reported a large variability in effect sizes. There's an overall medium effect size or a small effect size, 0.25, uh, not a super large effect size, but um, the most important result to me from this meta-analytic study was that there is huge variability. Like, effect sizes are all over the place. Um, and there's a lot of variation between labs, between different types of stimuli, etc. cetera. Um, and then, um, finally, there was a, a Dutch replication effort uh, 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 from last year uh, that actually found a, a no result. And that uh, also... Uh, 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 reflects some of uh, some other labs that also found no results in the past couple of years, some of them unpublished and some of them published. Uh, so there's some worry about the robustness of the effects or what factors determine whether there is going to be an effect. Um, okay, so this is where we're at. Um, so uh, 
Data collection is, is ongoing but almost uh, finished. Uh, we expect that uh, labs to submit their data by, uh, by March 31. Um, so they have a couple more months to, uh, to finish data collection. And we expect an overall sample size of about 600 participants, um, infant participants. Um, and then after data cleaning process, MB2 has just experienced that process, we'll probably end up with 480 or so uh, as a final data set to, to be able to analyze. Um, good. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about a couple of spin-off projects. Um, Clyde, when do you want, do you want to jump in or? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so, um, um, as the Many Babies One example already showed, uh, this type of project affords, affords the possibility to have many like add-on projects, spin-off projects, etc. cetera, uh, you know, uh, answer additional research questions that you can only answer in this type of setting with many labs uh, participating. Um, and one of them is the Many Babies Three Nears uh, 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 study uh, that will be talked about in the next talk uh, by Judith. Um, then again, we, we also were interested in assessing individual differences uh, for a number of reasons, just for the sake of it. <laughs> we want to know, you know, is rule learning really an ability that infants have and can we measure it reliably? Uh, and second, as a measure also to follow up studies, right? So if we're, if we're saying that rule learning is important, is an important ability for infants to have to acquire linguistic competence, um, well, then we should be able to measure it early on and then predict later language outcomes. So that's our plan for the longitudinal follow-up. Um, and the second one is the, uh, or the final one is the uh, pupil dilation, uh, which is uh, currently being set up. Um, okay, so um, I think Martin already uh, quite aptly uh, talked about the need for test retest reliability um, and, uh, and explained why it's important that, uh, you know, if we want to not just study cognitive processes as we do when we're studying rule learning effects, but also want to consider this as an individual differences variable, uh, then we need something else, right? And we need, the first thing we need is test retest reliability. Um, as you can also see, these are the results from the Many Babies 1 test retest reliability uh, that wasn't very hopeful, right? Um, and it illustrates the point that I made earlier. Infant data is very noisy, uh, not, not much data typically available per infant, um, and hence uh, it's actually hard to use these as an individual differences measures. What was hopeful for Martin's pr presentation is I think the, uh, the observation that if you use more trials, uh, that you can uh, have better reliability. Um, and of course, we know that from psychometric theory, if you have more data, then you get more reliable measures, right? But now we need to find a way to actually get that from infants. I'm not sure how to do that with rule learning yet, but uh, I guess just have a look at more trials as well. Um, um, what I also think uh, this illustrates is, uh, interestingly, the Many Babies 1 had a large effect size, right? Or, or at least a medium effect size. It had a very robust effect size, right? And uh, so it illustrates the point that you can have, uh, basically, for every single participant, you can have very unreliable data, but you can still have uh, a proper effect size, right? So basically, on the individual level, we're not measuring anything. But on the collective or in the group level, on the experimental level, apparently something's going on, right? Um, I think that's an interesting uh, paradox. Good. Um, so these are the research questions for uh, the test retest reliability uh, uh, spin off study for uh, Many Babies Tree. Um, uh, we designed a uh, new stimuli. Um, for uh, using uh, using uh, the same uh, syllable set but restructuring uh, the uh, the stimuli such that they hadn't seen them 
uh, before, right? So we don't want to use this the same identical stimuli in the in the in the in the time that they get back to the lab, but want to use a different set of stimuli such that there's no learning effect between sessions. Um, so we needed to re, uh, redesign some of the test stimuli. Um, okay. Um, What's going on currently is that we have, uh, we're aiming for uh, 150 participants approximately. A uh, number of labs have already uh, said that they will be collecting uh, data for this, uh, um, uh, for this study. Uh, we have the same inclusion exclusion criteria as the main, uh, main study. Um, and the data collection will end three months after the main Many Babies 3 data collection. So we're expecting to have data also uh, before the summer. Um, yes, this is the current status. Um, then for uh, the second follow-up study uh, is the uh, rule learning uh, and the question whether that predicts language learning later on. Um, here for this, uh, to, to study this question, we're setting up the Many Babies 3 uh, language uh, follow-up or longitudinal follow-up, whatever the L stands for in your, uh, in your preference. Um, apparently, uh, we found no studies that actually study this connection. Although rural learning has been implicated or has been argued to form the basis of language learning, there hasn't been a long longitudinal follow-up studying this correlation between early rural learning and later language. Uh, outcomes, um, and hence we thought it was really important to start doing that. Um, okay, so um, um, here the research question is is very simple. Uh, if there is such a thing as a rule learning ability, and we can reliably measure it uh, during the first year of life, does it then predict uh, uh, CDI outcomes at age 24 to 30 months? Uh, so language skills as measured by the CDI uh, such as grammatical skills and uh, vocabulary. Um, yeah, so this is the, this, the setup there. Uh, we're measuring uh, rule learning ability at age 5 to 12 months, as we do in the Many Babies 3 study, the same infants, of course. Um, and then at 24 to 30 months, we follow up with the, uh, with the CDI, and uh, we're using uh, some of the measures uh, that the CDI offers, such as vocabulary and uh, grammatical, uh, grammatical skills. Um, um, to, uh, to ease the possibility for labs to contribute to this, uh, we're only doing a single measurement in the range of 24 to 30 months, so we have quite a large window uh, in which they can test, uh, do the follow-up testing uh, which we think is important because uh, it allows, well, much flexibility in labs, right? So uh, if they have been testing five to 12 month olds for the uh, initial many baby tree sample, um, then if they have that flexibility, uh, that large window, that will afford them uh, easy, uh, easy testing, hopefully. Uh, otherwise, inclusion and exclusion are the same as for the many babies tree overall study. Um, currently, uh, what's going on is that the stu study is being uh, pre-registered. We're finalizing the pre-registration uh, form, um, and then we expect the first labs that did many babies tree data collection in spring of last year, that they will be able to do their follow-up testing with, the, uh, with their first uh, infants in the spring of this year. Okay, so uh, that also indicates immediately uh, all the possibilities that you can have for uh, contributions. Uh, although data collection, it's a little bit late for data collection for many babies tree. Uh, uh, there's still much uh, work that uh, needs to be done. Uh, in particular, we're uh, awaiting the data to, to be collected very soon. So uh, writing uh, analysis code and documenting the analysis code is going to be very important in the next couple of months uh, as we expect the data to come in. Um, uh, and then, of course, writing up uh, the final report. And we also welcome uh, 
uh, yeah, contributions of any kind in that, uh, in that respect. Um, similarly, for the many babies tree uh, test retest and, uh, um, and uh, language follow-ups, um, uh, there's still plenty of opportunity in reviewing the pre-registration report or preparing the materials for the uh, language follow-up, the CDI questionnaire. For example, we need different language versions, of course, for the CDI. We need to make sure that we use the correct translated versions uh, of all of those in different countries. Uh, and of course, the data collection if you were part of Man Many Babies 3 already. Um, for Many Babies 3, the pupil dilation, I haven't said much about that, but uh, the, uh, we're only just getting started. Uh, so, uh, eye tracking data is being collected in, um, in about 15 labs for Many Babies 3. Um, and uh, so that provides us with the opportunity to study pupil dilation during rural learning and during uh, the test phase of the rural learning uh, experiment. Um, uh, and hence, we can just analyze those data. So this is a secondary data analysis project that we're anticipating to do once the data is in. Uh, and we have a first meeting on January 16 to plan how we will approach this, what exactly will be uh, the research questions, what parts of the data will we be using, etc. Um, thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true, and we tried. <laughs> we tried our best. Uh, so we had a large group of people working on this, um, with many different language backgrounds, and and so you know we made these uh, we made these uh, sequences, uh, and then asked people in that larger group to like you know make sure that this is not in your language or not recognizable in in your language. You were much more involved in that. And I also wanted to maybe respond to an earlier question about procedural variations. So, um, so l like in the Many Babies 2, uh, we had a large, we have a manual describing, you know, how should you perform this experiment. Um, and you can then choose from head term preference, central fixation, or eye tracking. And so we have these different variations. Um, and so, yes, it's good to limit the, the procedural variation. Uh, but then again, there are also lab-specific practices, right? So, you know, the way in which a specific lab does their head term preference uh, can be slightly different from another lab. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, right? It's also good for the robustness of our results, right? If it turns out that one lab does their uh, head term preference this way and another lab does it like a slightly different way, uh, and if it turns out that then, you know, the, the results are going to be wildly different. Well, what does that tell us about the cognitive phenomenon that we're studying, right? If it's going to be like so sensitive to really small variations, right? So, so we're we're trying to limit procedural variation on the one hand, but we're also allowing some procedural variation on the other hand, and trying to test the robustness of our results across those procedural variations. Um, and the way that we then track those procedural variations is through the method of uh, these uh, lab uh, walkthrough videos, right? So we asked labs to send us a video of their procedure, um, and then, you know, should it turn out that there's gonna be huge variation across all these different uh, labs, then we can trace back, like, what are the procedural variations that may be causing this. Um, so that other other questions
If not, I guess we're moving on to our next recorded talk by uh, Judith about the Many Babies Tree uh, Nears uh, add-on project. Judith's talk is 15 minutes, minutes, which is good. The half an hour break was designed to have a bit of a buffer. I hope it's fine for you, but it should be in, in time. Hello. The project I'm going to talk Hello. about is the Many Babies I'm going to talk nears. about is Many Babies, many babies Three, three nears. nears is many babies a replication study of repetition, a replication uh, study of repetition, uh, grammar, uh, based ruler learning, artificial using uh, grammar, ruler learning, learning, using functional using spectroscopy. Spectroscopy. So functional the theoretical aim of the project is the theoretical aim of the project repetition based um, rule learning as a basic and based rule learning as a basic language acquisition and as such language acquisition provides a conceptual link and provides a conceptual link and converts Evidence, the behavior of babies counterpart the behavior um, investigating counterparty um, investigating this at the methodological ability. level this at is the methodological the first, level uh, multi site replication the first study uh, multi site replication study using, uh, that near infants spectroscopy, using, not, uh, only near infants, spectroscopy but, um, not only with infants spectroscopy not only with infants but um, in the general. original study uh, the original study in 2008 uh, conducted showed that newborn in infants, so infants showed that newborn infants so days so immediately at birth days um, so show an increased birth, hemodynamic um, show an increased hemodynamic um, to sequences response, that contain um, to sequences that contain sequences with the structure ABB, ABB sequences, where the second with the structure ABB, ABB are identical, are identical and third as compared to diversity based sequences as compared to diversity based sequences is ABB so triselic sequences is ABC where this greater hemodynamic Response, this uh, greater um, hemodynamic based sequences um, was localized based sequences um, in the was localized temporal um, in the um, left areas of temporal the brain, so the auditory um, cortex areas of the and the left so the auditory cortex frontal areas and the left brain inferior frontal area, areas of the brain uh, and other related area, brain areas both uh, and of other these, related brain are, areas uh, well known to be part of well known to be part of the language network in the adult brain we um, use near infrared we, spectros um, spectroscopy, use near spe um, spectroscopy, which is a brain um, imaging technique which that measures brain imaging uh, the hemodynamic that correlates of neural uh, activity, the so in particular of neural activity, activity um, so in particular it measures of oxygenated um, concentration and changes of oxygenated um, hemoglobin. And deoxygenated, this, uh, um, hemoglobin. this technique is particularly this, uh, well suited, this technique to, is test particularly well young, suited um, to test young babies infants, and young children, um, young babies for a number of reasons. First, for a number of reasons. It is um, and totally not quite invasive, easy and to use, quite comfortable, um, easy to use. Recent uh, technological um, advances, recent, uh, have technological made the advances technique uh, increasingly made the portable technique and wearable, increasingly so it is becoming portable and wearable, now, so it is uh, becoming to test feasible now, moving, uh, to test uh, behaving, and children, moving uh, infants and, and compared children. to other techniques like EEG, and compared to uh, other or MRI, like this EEG, technique is uh, or MRI, tolerant this technique to is so for all these reasons, actually, so for all these reasons, have been used developmental laboratories. Um, have been increasing in years uh, often, um, and as you can see in the last often, maybe 10, 15 years, the last number of 10, 15 years, the number of increased exponentially. Um, also, uh, so there is a reason to, um, uh, so there is a to reason be interested to, in um, near to be interested in near uh, in the developed cross community, uh, but of in the course, community, um, but of it course, is not without its um, challenges. It is and most of these are challenges to the fact, and most of these are related to the fact. Nears, that uh, um, is a relatively recent nears, technique. Uh, so, it's a relatively um, recent The first technique. studies so, with infants go um, back. The first um, studies with infants go back um, to the early 2000s. As a consequence of this, um, as a consequence of this, all the technological advances that are still ongoing, that are so the novel systems, so the novel systems coming out, uh, that um, there is keep coming uh, out. Really is, high uh, frost lab variability. Really high how frost lab acquired from the type of headgear acquired from the type of headgear. Uh, uh, that laboratories different uh, parameters of the setup, parameters and this is of very the setup, often, um, and this is very often in publications, um, undocumented in publications. Data analysis itself is all also data highly analysis variable. Itself is all uh, also with many highly variable using uh, with many laboratories using ad hoc um, in house ad hoc um, in house um, scripts. Um, Pipelines and scripts, so, 
this results so, uh, um, in this results uh, in large um, and mostly uh, large, undocumented, uh, large and mostly undocumented cross lab variability undocumented cross lab standardization in the field is standardization only now, in the field um, is only now starting to emerge um, with the starting first to emerge best with the first few status best report papers coming out in the report last papers um, two, coming three years out in the last um, two and, three years um, to, to the best of our knowledge and, um, there to, has been, to the best of our um, knowledge no there has been replication uh, no study, replication, larger scale replication study, study using FNIRS not only in the development using of FNIRS community, not only in the development the of FNIRS community, community, but in, in the, general. the FNIRS community. So, in given general. all these reasons, in so early, given all these um, reasons, in early um, 2020, uh, we decided to uh, launch, we inspired decided by to all launch, these successful, inspired by all um, these successful many babies um, projects. Um, to Many babies project uh, a replication um, study uh, using a replication study uh, using uh, FNIRS. Slow down a little uh, bit by the pandemic. Slow down a little bit phase, by the pandemic. Um, so the working out the phase, stimuli, the paradigm, um, so working out the um, stimuli, the analysis pipeline, um, and the analysis three, pipeline um, um, years and now early 2024. Uh, and now we are about to finish. We are about to finish registered report manuscript, which will hopefully be submitted, which will hopefully be submitted. Um, uh, weeks. In, uh, next and so few, as a function uh, of weeks, uh, how long and so as a function of we'll uh, take, we're expecting the process to take, we're expecting some time in 2024, some time in 2024, the time for data with, collection um, being open, the time for data uh, collection for at least a year and a half, for at least a year and a half, two uh, years, possibly. So um, far, two years. Uh, so 35 far, laboratories have signed uh, up. 35 laboratories have signed up. That it is not I would like to mention that it is um, not a criterion for signing up to be able to um, for signing up to be able to data. contribute many NIRS labs data. Um, do many labs contribute, um, but it is also possible for other individuals or other aspects in particular for other aspects in for other aspects in particular for other aspects in particular as we will see data analysis even this brain imaging technique data analysis is really complex with data analysis is really complex with a lot of degrees of to be done so we also and a lot of work to be done so we also those labs or individuals from who do not necessarily have access to do not necessarily have access to near species these labs actually come from these labs actually come from different countries, on different countries, countries on four different and so uh, we are particularly happy so, that we will be able uh, we are particularly to, um, happy study that we will be able to um, study infants um, growing up with um, growing understudied up with, languages um, such as um, understudied languages um, such as um, Chinese um, languages um, different, um, Chinese um, languages or Basque um, Brazilian Portuguese um, and or of Basque. course these also cover um, and of course uh, these also cover uh, broad cultural uh, relatively uh, range broad cultural those labs that contribute those labs that um, um, contribute will contribute um, either a full sample will contribute of, um, either a full 40, sample of um, um, participants 40 or um, participants a half sample is also or possible a half sample most is labs also come possible from the developmental most community labs and come so from they the contribute community um, and data from infants between zero and data five months between zero and this is relevant uh, this is age relevant uh, this broad age range is relevant also because previous that, studies suggest that around six to nine months around six to nine months change so one of the theoretical Change so one of the theoretically is the development factors we are interested in is the development um, of this trajectory um, basic um, of this um, learning um, ability basic uh, and as there is ability, quite a lot of enthusiasm and about as the there is quite a lot of enthusiasm about the project community, in the broader near so not only labs that work with infants so not only uh, labs that near work with infants in general we uh, but we also, also have in general uh, labs joining also have don't have labs joining but are happy don't have access to infants adult data which is quite relevant because adult data which is absolutely relevant because adult data is absolutely no, neural correlates uh, adult data on the so neural it's very interesting of this ability so it's very interesting to look at end the point, developmental uh, end point, and we are looking at uh, uh, and we are looking at uh, from now on in the presentation you will see from now on in the presentation members, you will see um, names of project members appearing um, because they appearing, contributed um, to that because specific they contributed, uh, aspect or to that specific aspect or to the specific aspect of the project aspect of the stimuli that we will be using the stimuli that we will be Using are of course uh, diversity based based and grammars, and diversity so the same price of the grammars, so the same uh, price as in the previous studies uh, and ABB grammar, in the previous studies so, and uh, ABB grammar, based grammar, so final repetition, repetition, grammar, second and final repetition, identical, second and third, and a diversity being identical, uh, based and a diversity grammar uh, based ABC. The grammar will be synthesized, the stimuli will be synthesized, project again, and we will be using project alternating, non alternating paradigm, alternating, non alternating paradigm. 
half of the blocks will implement um, only half of one the blocks regularity, will implement either only one ABB regularity, or either only, only ABC, ABC, so these are the non-alternating C, so these are the, the other non half of the blocks will implement the other half of the blocks regularities, both um, regularities in an alternating fashion. Um, in, as in an can, alternating um, fashion here in the lower box can, car. Um, this allows us box to car. compare this allows us alternating and non alternating blocks on alternating the one hand. and non alternating so blocks on the one hand. So this gives us an idea of discrimination. Indeed, the alternating paradigm Indeed, the alternating is a commonly used paradigm, paradigm is a um, paradigm for behavioral, behavioral um, discrimination. Paradigm fine for grade, a fine grade, perceptual discrimination fine grade in general. A perceptual discrimination in general. But we can also compare the ABC and ABC non alternating blocks directly. And this will give us information. And this will give us um, information about and localization uh, the brain mechanisms of where and each of the regularities and how each of each the regularities are, how each of the regularities um, are processed um, in the brain. And just as an example uh, in the brain, um, and stimuli, just as an example of um, the stimuli. In terms of data acquisition, in we terms will, of um, data acquisition, provide, we will um, the stimuli provide and, uh, the paradigm. The stimuli and, these will uh, these the have paradigm. been centrally defined. These, will, these have been centrally uh, defined. But we allow labs to uh, otherwise we allow vary to otherwise and use their regular common and use their regular practices. So of course, the nearest machine they have, so of course, the nearest they machine they have, the uh, but also. They have. Um, other but also techniques such as the way they entertain other the baby, right? such as the way they entertain the baby, right? and, and of course these will be methodological variables. these will be methodological variables. So the contribution of these on the variables, the contribution of these variables that on the data our statistical is something that we we'll look at. Our statistical analysis for the we'll headgear. Um, this is actually for the headgear uh, an important um, issue this is because, because of course, uh, an important the, issue because the of course, layout or the, the configuration the of the headgear determines the what brain of the headgear area labs will be looking at. But of course, labs will have be looking at. Um, but of course, labs have different be, um, will not headgears. Be able to be, standardize. Will not this for obvious be able reasons. To but we will for um, ask reasons, laboratories but we will, um, to concentrate um, on the temporal and frontal areas where we know and frontal areas where we know take place. And indeed, this is take place. And indeed, this is. Taken into uh, a factor that will in, again be um, taken into the data analysis in, pipeline. Um, the, the data analysis so pipeline. The main challenge. So is, the main um, challenge in this project is, is indeed um, the high degree of freedom. Is indeed the high uh, in particular the, freedom. Uh, and in particular the freedom. So the high number of decisions. Freedom. So the high number of decisions that need to for be data taken. analysis. And those of you who are familiar with uh, and those of you who are familiar uh, with the technique will know that each of these aspects each of these aspects of data analysis or um, active research own. fields. Um, in so essentially, own. we have a lot of decisions. So essentially, um, to be we have taken a lot of decisions in areas um, where to be taken in areas where emerge standards. So the project will embrace some of this. So the project will embrace some either with the main project or either with side projects or spin-off projects, side projects or spin-off projects where there are no um, standards. Um, where there are no standards, a few common practices um, we will be trying to implement. We will be trying to implement several, the um, most commonly used, most or several, um, the most commonly practices or analysis um, parameters, practices or analysis parameters, impact of these actually parameters understand the impact of these parameters. So, the data analysis includes so, um, localization, data analysis includes uh, localization discussed, uh, in terms of the headgear, uh, both uh, in terms of the headgear, both anatomically, functionally, and quality assessment of the data. So, quality assessment of the data uh, so how to much understand how reliably uh, how much um, or how reliably have measured the hemodynamic um, response we have measured the noise or, response or, as opposed to uh, noise or more general or systemic uh, responses more general pre processing of course which is very pre common pre processing of course which is to, very common um, neuroimaging techniques to, um, um, neuroimaging we techniques bare bones um, a really we will basic use, uh, bare bones a really basic um, pre processing um, pipeline um, pre processing uh, pipeline of filtering and artifact detection of filtering and removal detection and or correction removal, and final or correction analysis and final um, statistical in analysis will, um, in which we will um, use both a meta analytic um, use and both a meta analytic and type of uh, approach a mixed modeling of course, type of um, approach crucially and important of course um, crucially quantifying the effect size so the replicability the effect size so the replicability um, but also um, of the, the study but um, also the variability the, that we find um, across laboratories the variability and the that factors we find across laboratories um, impact this variability that, um, 
in that I mentioned earlier, some of these I mentioned earlier, some of the type of near special, the type of near special, the different labs, the wavelength or the type of headgear. The wavelength, but we are also interested in theoretical but we are also interested in the age of the variants or their language background and whether or their language background and whether these implications for the final implications for the final results. In addition to um, this, um, in addition very to this um, obvious, very central goal, obvious replicability, and central goal, we are also hoping that we, this project we are also will, hoping that we, contribute this project will, will allow um, laboratories contribute this to, allow laboratories to harmonize different laboratories uh, to harmonize uh, their data, uh, their data and data analysis practices and data analysis practices. So this will serve um, practices. So this will serve um, um, better or more uh, widespread standardization, more widespread standardization. Uh, Near methodology, uh, uh, near methodology, at least in the uh, developed community, at least in the developed community. And last but not community. least, our project last but also not has least, our project uh, a very general also has aim to uh, a sort very of train aim novice laboratories, sort of train um, novice laboratories. Um, if, uh, in the use of NIRS, actually, uh, many in the labs use of NIRS, up, actually many labs that are going that to be using up, NIRS uh, for the first time using in NIRS and says, for the use first this time project and as a stepping says, use stone. this project as a um, stepping stone. We will um, pay particular attention we will, um, pay to particular attention novice laboratories to company and help them novice mentor them and help them the setup, mentor um, them the study the setup allowing study more and more allowing more and more to start using labs. Uh, uh, to this, start using um, methodologies. Uh, this, um, Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, for staying with us in this quite uh, tough timeline. So one last talk, and then there's a break, and I hope you then come back uh, fresh, and we have some more time for discussions. Um, Francis, please. All right, thanks. All right. Uh, I'm sure um, we all want coffee pretty soon. I'm. I, I know me and Ingmar desperately need some coffee, so I'll try to. Kind of blaze through this a little bit. Um, so, uh, as part of the last kind of project update, I want to talk about Many Babies 4, which looks at infant social evaluation. Just a very quick roadmap for today. I'll give a very quick intro. I'm, I'm probably going to skip through a lot of the big picture stuff um, about uh, the project and why uh, we're motivated to study this particular phenomenon. Talk about some preliminary results as we just finished data collection a, a couple of months ago now. Um, uh, one of my collaborators, Yi Wei, has been uh, working very hard to kind of get some preliminary findings for BCCCD. Um, we will be presenting much more, hopefully, if it gets accepted uh, at I ICIS in Glasgow. So maybe I'll see some of you there since this is like, it'll, it'll be home, once again home turf for many of you and uh, a long flight for me again. And uh, instead of kind of diving too much into these de preliminary results, I will instead talk very much like the, uh, my other colleagues, uh, the spin-off projects, and as well as like next, next steps that we're going to be taking. So as a kind of quick primer, um, babies uh, in like, I would say in the last decade and a half, uh, studies of uh, babies' um, social evaluative capacities have kind of blossomed, um, due in no small part to um, Hamlin et al.'s 2007 finding. Um, very quick description, babies watch uh, uh, videos, or sorry, live puppet shows of this little red circle with googly eyes trying to accomplish a goal, in this case trying to go to the top of the hill, but it's a little bit too steep, so he can't quite make it up. And then a different shape will come in and do something nice, bump him up, or do something mean and bump him down. 
watching, uh, after watching several of these videos, babies physically get the characters to choose from, and who, whichever character they touch first is taken to be their social preference. That's the, the character that they like more. They positively evaluate it. So the main finding for this uh, study is that the vast majority of six and 10 month olds uh, prefer to choose the helper, the character um, that pushes the protagonist up the hill. And most critically, when you take away the eyes so that this circle is just an eyeless red blob and show no signs of self propelled motion for all intents and purposes, it's just the red ball. And they watch the two characters now push the, just, just the ball up a hill or down a hill. They no longer show this preference, suggesting that whatever preference they were showing um, previously is unlikely due to lower level perceptual features. For example, just a general preference for someone who pushes things up versus pushing things down. Now, since then, there's been a massive, uh, well, I like to think it's massive, wave of research into social evaluation. Some involve more direct replications using the Hill paradigm, uh, maybe with slight little tweaks. Some might be conceptual replications that also look, like, look at social evaluation, uh, preference for helpers versus hinders, but with different scenarios. So uh, in what's commonly known as a box show, they will instead watch a cute puppet try to open a really heavy box but can't quite do it. Uh, and then a different puppet will come in and help them open the box uh, or do something mean like slam the box shut. Um, and overall, these findings seem to be a little bit conflicting uh, and on both ends of the spectrum. So there are successful replications uh, by the original authors as well as independent labs. But there are also uh, unsuccessful replications, uh, even when the original authors are heavily involved in providing guidance. And so this begs the question of, you know, what exactly is going on? Uh, in 2018, uh, to kind of shed light on this, there was a meta-analysis by Margonian and Syrian um, to kind of provide a, uh, to, to collapse across uh, not only both published and unpublished findings, but also a bunch of different kinds of social evaluation beyond just helping and hindering, such as uh, fair distribution, um, giving versus taking, so on and so forth. And overall, it seems to be positive. Babies um, and infants and toddlers seem to be choosing above chance, about 64% of the time, the more positively valence character. But of course, there's still outstanding issues, uh, sending questions to be answered. Um, the first issue is that it's not clear why some replications are more successful than others. There's at least two non-mutually exclusive possibilities. The first is that maybe the effect size is just smaller than one stuff. Maybe babies just don't, they care a little bit, but they don't care that much. Um, indeed, if you remember the original findings, a huge majority prefer the helper, right? But that was also a small sample size. So if the effect, true effect size is smaller than anticipated, um, the tradition, traditional sample of 8, 16, 24 infants, perhaps it's just not large enough to capture, and that explains the, the, the variance in, in replication success rate. Now the second one, which uh, is a, a bit more of an interesting one, is that perhaps there's variations in methodology or even the population that's being studied that's driving these differences. So um, different labs might have do things slightly differently, even if they're using the same stimuli, because um, this is the, I, I, I believe the first of like the, the many babies projects that we saw today that involves direct researcher involvement in collecting that dependent variable, right? Um, contrasting that to something like maybe Babies 2, um, where it's an uh, eye tracking study, it's very plug and play, you sit the infant down and then the eye tracker does its thing. This time there's an actual researcher showing the baby, interacting with the baby, and so of course there's some more degrees of freedom there um, and some uh, across researcher, let alone across lab variants. And then the second issue is um, that they, uh, even though the meta has uh, shed light on, on this topic already, it did not include any control conditions. So the aforementioned control condition where the red circle no longer has eyes, the meta analysis doesn't look at any of that. Um, so even though the original study kind of rules out um, uh, these effects being driven by perceptual features, it's less clear or, um, you know, the same can't be said about all of the studies uh, that have come after. So the actual mechanisms for why infants are 
may or may not be showing this effect. Even if we do find it, it's not super clear. And that brings us to many babies four. We are using Hamlet et al.'s 2000 study as a case study for social evaluation. So this was not meant to be an end-all be-all do infants do social evaluation because there's many ways to study this. We're choosing one of the original findings as a case study to, end, uh, to achieve these objectives. The first is to shed light on the true effect size of a helper preference. The second is to examine any moderating variables that might be uh, impacting these effect sizes. And the third is to uh, use a, so, uh, a non-social control condition to see if uh, these preferences, should we find them, are so truly social in nature. And as a bonus objective, paralleling all the other many babies projects we've seen so far, we want to create a big data set that is openly available for researchers to ask more interesting questions later down the road. Okay, so um, I don't think we can do it uh, developmental presentation without videos. Um, I am similarly traumatized by these videos, like Toby uh, with his, uh, but mine are thankfully about a third of the length. So here in the social condition, this is the helping scenario. Uh, the red circle, he's trying to go up. He can't quite make it up. And he gets bumped up, he leaves the scene, and that's it. And in the non-social scenario, you see, he doesn't do anything, he's just a ball, and then the character comes in, follows the exact same motion, the exact same pacing, well, as, as close as possible without it being unnatural, um, and then he leaves the scene as well. So labs uh, uh, across the world um, uh, randomly assign infants uh, to either the social or the non-social condition, fully between subjects. Oh, it's, gonna, it's doing the thing. Okay. Great, um, so I'm gonna quickly define habituation here. Uh, so this, unlike, unlike um, MB2, for example, which used a familiarization design where infants always saw a set number of trials, uh, MB4 opted to do habituation, where we would set a pre uh, criteria after the first three trials that they watch, and then we measure their, the sum of their looking time on consecutive trials. And an infant is considered to be habituated when their uh, looking time sum on three consecutive trials drops below half of that initial criteria. Um, and this allows us to show infants as many trials as they really want to see, right? And a more attentive baby will see more trials. A baby who might have digested information quicker will then see fewer trials. Okay, so um, this re relates to a question that um, you asked earlier. We place great emphasis on standardization for many reasons. Our manual, I think, was like 50 pages long. Um, and I know for a fact, anecdotally, that some people didn't read it. Um, and uh, it, it, and this, this is, it becomes painfully obvious when you get into the validator stage that we were talking about earlier. Some people unfortunately submitted nonsensical data and had to very politely as a PhD student tell faculty members like, oh, your data doesn't, doesn't, uh, didn't pass the validator check, could you please, you know, kind of fix it. Um, so, in addition to standardizing stimuli, so everyone saw videos, by the way, a very quick side note, we decided to pre-film the puppet shows instead of getting labs to train individual puppeteers to do the live shows for very obvious standardization uh, reasons. In addition to that, we also standardized two things. The first is how the researchers presented the characters. There's a very specific way and very specific orientation that researchers have to show the, the, the triangle and the square. And in order for labs to be approved to run the study, they have to send pilot videos either with real babies or with an adult pretending to be a baby or holding a puppet pretending to be a baby. Um, three of these videos need to be approved by me before they get the green light to run the study. And uh, this is not just one person per lab. If any person wants to do that choice procedure from any lab, even if their PI already passed the training, they also have to resubmit three new ones. And then the second one is a bit of a nightmare for myself, is we standardize the characters themselves. It might seem trivial uh, to just draw a triangle and then put eyes on it. Um, over the years, we have found that different shades of colors elicit different responses. Uh, so in an effort to truly standardize everything, labs follow like very um, 
specific like, kind of like five minute craft videos that we have made to make these characters themselves or if they can't hunt down the specific shade of blue that we ask them to get, I make them and I mail it out to them. So <laughs> I have crafted like 40 pairs of uh, these phone characters um, as part of my degree. So, you know, I, easy career pivot if this doesn't work out. Okay, so um, these two standardization, uh, uh, well, Actually, I'm just gonna move on. So this is, once again, outdated, but uh, for the full list of contributors, you can go look at the mini babies um, dashboard. And then now I'm gonna dive into the results, uh, keep in mind the time. So we ended up with a, a total of 672 babies after exclusion, which is really, really nice. Uh, from 34 different labs, there's a little bit of an asterisk there because one lab co contributed data, but then all of their infants, unfortunately, was excluded. Um, there was a pretty big exclusion rate with, a, again, a bit of an asterisk, um, as you probably expect, because this uh, is a procedure that requires a researcher, researcher interaction with the infant, and infants only get one shot to contribute data, right? They only get one choice between the two characters. If they don't choose, they don't get inclu included for very obvious reasons. Um, and sometimes researchers kind of botch the process and that also results in their data not being keepable. But um, the kind of good news is that this is not, this is pretty par for course for this kind of study. So uh, just a quick um, uh, reminder, the main research question was to see if there's a buff chance cho choosing of the helper in the social condition, but not in the non-social condition. And we were also interested, as a bonus, if there's any developmental differences, right? It, since the age range span from five to 10 months, we wanted to see if this uh, ability to pick out who's the nice one versus the mean one improves or gets worse with age. Uh, we took a Bayesian approach in order to maximally incorporate past work. We ran our analysis both with an informative prior as uh, informed by uh, the meta-analysis or with a, a non-informative prior. I won't get too much into that. Uh, I will kind of just jump ahead and tell you that we did not find what we we're looking for. Uh, so um, the addition of a main effect of condition, so social versus non-social, um, did not increase the model fit. Uh, and to kind of make sense of what that means, babies were basically a chance across the board. Uh, in the social condition and in the non-social condition, they chose about half and half. Slightly more in the non-social, they prefer the push-up character for some reason, um, but it, it's, it's very, a very, very small percentage. Now, of course, with such a rich data set, it would be a disservice to only look at that. So we, of course, um, oh, actually, sorry. I would just also show this um, plot that we have seen several times here, uh, of showing the, uh, the effect size distributed by the 34 contributing labs. Big variance, um, there's no real pattern that like, uh, larger sample size corresponds with uh, significant or non-significant uh, findings. Okay, so uh, the next thing uh, we want to look at is the role of moderators. Um, because there's so many different labs, there's so many different things that can change, we do allow some uh, between across lab freedom. We, we took the approach of just adding the moderator and comparing to the null model, see if it improves model fit. We took this approach for both our pre-registered moderators, such as attention to the video events, if babies paying more attention do better or worse, clear versus ambiguous choices, so if a baby like looks at a character and like lunges for it, or if they kind of look, uh, look at a character but then like ends up touching both characters by accident. Um, we also had some non-pre-registered moderators that we were curious uh, about, such as um, you know, female versus female, uh, lab level factors like what country they were from, uh, and uh, what, how many years of experience they required their researchers to have before they're allowed to run the uh, study. Um, all in all, none of these models found anything except for one, and it, it is a bit confusing, so I'm not gonna read too much into it, but I will show you what we found, we found moderate evidence that there's an interaction between condition and whether or not infants habituated, which is why I spent a bit of time defining what habituation means earlier. Um, to kind of clarify, 
when I say an infant did not habituate, that means their attention never dropped below that criteria. They just kept either kept staring at the screen or they were really inattentive to start with. Either way, their attention across the multiple trials was about the same. But uh, when we take a closer look, we find that the habituated infants showed a preference for the push-up character, but in the, the non-social condition, which is the exact opposite of what we would expect, and the infants who didn't habituate still choose that chance for the social, but now they, for some reason, prefer the push-down character. What does this all mean? I really don't know. We've been having a lot of long meetings to try to figure out what this means. We have some uh, suspicions that maybe it has to do with some sort of goalie loss effect where um, infants who, uh, uh, well, maybe this simuli is just too fast or too difficult for some infants, so they kind of mentally check out and they start doing weird things. But it's all speculation at this point. And that brings us to where this is supposed to say discussion. I am just gonna ignore that because I, I don't have good answers for you today. I'm gonna talk about the next steps. Yeah, 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 I'll, I'll wrap up in like a minute. Okay, so first is we, we, we obviously failed to replicate the initial finding, but as I mentioned, um, this is not to say social evaluation just doesn't work. Um, there's been many publications that has came out since the meta-analysis, um, and a new meta-analysis, which is unpublished, seems to suggest that you know the effect is still holding, so uh, it, it's going to take a little bit of work to interpret why we're not, we didn't find um, the main effect. Um, I'm going to actually just quickly skip through this, uh, and shout out to a couple of CINA projects that are currently in the works. The first one is MB4I, which examines individual differences. So if parent, uh, uh, different things like parenting style or um, how parents choose to talk about moral concepts affects infant social evaluation. And all of this data is currently being analyzed, but there seems to be some connection so far where infants' pro-social behavior is um, positively related to things like parental curiosity in uh, infants' own mental states and the frequency of um, parents playing social games with their infants. So some individual differences potentially there. And finally, uh, we're also looking at emotional responses um, uh, using fax coding to see if infants, uh, we have lots of great videos of babies reacting to these helping scenes. Um, we wanted to see if any emotional responses predict their uh, social preference, as well as if any partial responses um, predict um, uh, their preference as well. So, uh, do I'm sorry, that was a little bit rushed, uh, but just a quick thank you to my advisor, Kyla Hamlin, who um, kind of put her stick her neck out there to, to, on the chopping block, putting her work out there, uh, uh, and really being instrumental in helping make this happen, as well as my um, co-lead, Kelsey Luca, who has been um, a great mentor in, in helping me as, like, or as early as I was an undergrad to co-lead this project. Um, thanks for sticking with us. That's really tough. I usually pass out like after an hour. Um, Jonathan told us we have to hurry up for the coffee break. Okay, so maybe let's start uh, now, and I hope it's okay for you if you postpone questions to you to the break, or maybe afterwards, and see you back at 11.15. Thank you very much. <laughs>